Welcome, welcome, welcome to Wednesday. Wednesday, excellent. Week six, class something or other, 14, I think. We will jump right in to uh, what are we doing today? We have some admin stuff or more or less, I have some admin style apologies to offer to you guys. We're going to finish what I wasn't able to finish on Monday. Just a little bit of the end of uh, Monday's lecture. I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown of um, the Loeb Classical Library. This is one of the many sources that we use, translation, translated sources that we use in classics. And uh, your reading this week has a selection from the Loeb. And so I thought I would tell you what they are. And uh, if you want to read more of them, how to use them. And then uh, we are going to talk an awful lot about Heracles. He is the next hero on our list. This, uh, fo or this image, does anyone know what this image is called? It's a fairly famous one. Just shout it out if you know it. All right, uh, this is the Farnese Hercules. And um, it's very famous. It was in the Farnese collection, uh, just an Italian person. And um, it is a marble statue, but it is based off of a bronze, an earlier Greek bronze. And I will take this opportunity to just talk about one small thing. This is, this is an aside. It has very little to do with mythology but it's something that really annoys me. This will always be called Roman copy of a Greek original. That is nonsense. It is a copy. It is absolutely a copy. Um, and the original was a cast bronze statue. It, well, there was an original and it was Greek. But the way that Roman copy of a Greek original is phrased is that the Romans had absolutely no originality or artistic talent or merit on their own. And the only thing that they could do is use tracing paper and copy the Greeks. That is the nonsense part. There was no such thing as a 3D printer in the ancient world. You couldn't go to Thingiverse and download the Greek original and then just walk away and have it chisel it itself out. This was an artistic production of the highest quality. That's why it's in, um, this, this one's in the Naples Museum. The bronze, uh, a copy of the bronze is in the Louvre in France. Very frequently, these copies would be a different scale than the bronze statue. And the skill and artistry, and frankly, the mathematical ability to translate something from one size to another is just as amazing as, or well, is the same kind of amazing to me as being able to come up with the composition in the first place. And so when you see art and you see Greek or Roman copy of a Greek original, know that, yeah, okay, fine. But um, also keep in mind that, uh, that they, they didn't have scanners, they didn't have printers. This is a, an artistic piece just like anything else. That's my rant and aside. You can uh, sleep well now, knowing about your Roman copies. Okay, so the admin stuff. Um, if you've been paying attention to the e-class, you notice that I have not posted a lot of uh, the slides and uh, the audio, and YouTube is, is quite far behind. I did try to put audio and slides up uh, for those that are unable to attend um, for most of the classes, but I'm, st I'm now a couple of classes behind, and YouTube is just really far behind. I'm sorry about this. It just it takes a lot of time to process this material after the fact, uh, for, especially for the YouTube. Uh, I like to make sure that the questions get posted in there if anyone has watched those YouTube ones. When you ask wonderful questions that you ask, uh, I want to make sure that those who are watching and listening can at least know what the question was so that they can understand what uh, what my response was. But anyway, there's no, really no excuse. I've just been late on this, so I'm sorry. I will, all of the slides and all of the audio will be up on E-Class that are missing today. 
and I will look to get all of my YouTubes up to date either today or tomorrow. Probably tomorrow, but uh, that should be as up to date as possible. Uh, if you haven't noticed, quiz five is live. Quiz one through four have closed. Or, uh, yeah, will close. But uh, grades are great. You guys are you're awesome. You're doing wonderful, which is terrible for me. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I guess uh, the quizzes, I, I hope you're doing the readings. I hope you're enjoying them. But uh, the quizzes are going to get a little more difficult. Um, I, they won't get tricky. I'm not going to use wordplay to try and get you or any, any nonsense like that. But they will get more difficult in that you will have to do some more um, in, uh, deeper dives into the sources and, uh, um, and integrate that stuff. But you guys are doing great. You're fantastic. I'm very pleased. I actually couldn't be happier. Uh, so the, thank you for that. But uh, we'll try and trip you up a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Ooh. I'll have to get back to you on that uh, because I think I designed the course to do that, but that's kind of a dick move. Um, yeah, I will see. I will get back to you on that. Oh, yeah, I, I also I've said I, I will get back to you guys on that, and I'll post a bunch of stuff on the announcements, and none of it has been posted. I definitely looked up Dreadnought, and whoever it was that was like, it means fears nothing. You're 100% right, so sorry about that. Um, I forgot, actually, what the other question was, which is why I didn't end up posting it. Uh, yeah. No, there shouldn't be a quiz during reading week because that's just really mean. You're, you, have, you have reading to catch up on. And um, the one thing that you, you will have all of the details for the final paper before reading week. So that instead of going to Mexico and parting it up, you can prepare for the p uh, paper and read and watch movies and enjoy yourself. Because obviously, that's what everyone's looking forward to doing, right? You know, that's a beach in reading week? Nah. Um, but yeah, so th there won't be a quiz over reading week. I can say that for sure. But uh, for the midterm, I'll have, to, I'll have to look and see how many quizzes and so on. Uh, any other questions based on what I've said so far? Okay. But yeah, as you can see here, your midterm um, will be released next Friday. And then it will be due on, yeah, uh, is next Friday the 15th? or is, And then it's due a week later, right? Sorry, what was that? Okay, there you go. Yeah, so it'll be due on the 22nd. You'll have a week to do it. Um, I will say, well, you'll get some more details I'll, on, on Friday's class. I will give some more details. But just to kind of reiterate the kind of quizzes that you've been having, there will be a double length version of that, but it will be more difficult um, than the quizzes have been so far. It will also be timed. So I've been looking at how long people have been taking to do the quizzes and also just to conferring how long I should try and make these things. Um, I believe, because if you think about it, the midterm would be written in an hour in the classroom, and there was going to be 20 questions like the ones the, uh, of your quizzes. So I'm, I'm thinking that you're going to have 20 minutes to do 20 questions. Um, so that's quite a bit shorter than a lot of you have been taking on the quizzes, which is fine. Like, uh, you know, just, just so you know, it's going to be rather stressful. Um, and then if anyone has time accommodations, don't worry. Uh, the, the time will be adjusted appropriately for your accommodations. But um, yeah, the, 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 the multiple choice and true and false and uh, matching on the midterm will be faster paced than the leisurely weekly quizzes. Yeah. I, uh, this is something I've been toying with back and forth. I believe I'm going to allow navigation uh, because it is timed. So the reason that you can't skip back and forth with the ones that you have all the time in the world for is just so that you can't look at all the questions, go and read it. Like, I just want you to be able to do them and, and move on. Uh, I don't know. 
It's the first time I've done anything where there's online stuff, so you'll have to bear with me. There's a little touch and go back and forth. But yeah, I think I think you should be able to navigate because it's already stressful enough um, with uh, with these questions. So in the midterm, you will be able to navigate back and forth, uh, unlike the quizzes. I will also be withholding. Um, you will not be able to tell which things you got wrong. You will be able to know um, once your once the midterm is marked. Uh, you will be able to know the entire. Um, Great on the midterm, but until it is closed for everyone, because we have some slightly different deadlines for uh, some individuals with accommodations, you will not know what you got wrong on that little quiz part, uh, the, the the multiple choice section. You'll just know what you got on it. Um, so uh, that'll take a little bit longer to come up than uh, than you normally expect. But like I said, I'll have far more details on Friday's class. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, any other questions based on what I've said thus far? Cool. So let's jump in to Monday. Here's our famous Brad Pitt as Achilles. What a what a looker. And uh, we were kind of at the point now where he had murdered all kinds of Trojans, and uh, he had murdered Hector. And he was, just wasn't done yet. And he dragged Hector's body around the battlefield, humiliating and uh, um, generally desecrating the, the, the memory. He refused to return the body to be buried by the family. And then eventually was convinced. King Priam eventually convinced him to return the body. And this is... Our hero, noble Achilles. He has slaves. He's vengeful. He's cruel. He's boastful. He is all around a big old jerk. And he is noble in the words of the text. But he's supposed to die. That's, that's like referenced numerous times in the Iliad. Oh, Achilles. You're immortal. You're going to die. Uh, you know, as long as you do this thing, you'll be fine. But if you do the thing, you're going to die. And there's a, there's a concept in film called Chekhov's gun. And this is a principle that if you show a gun on screen, somebody's got to do something with that gun. You can't just pop a gun on screen and do nothing with it. And so you're going to shoot somebody, or it's going to be part of a fight, or just something. The gun has to get used. Well, here's one of the oldest pieces of literature in uh, kind of European history. Chekhov's gun, Achilles is going to die, and nah, we're not going to deal with it. And the, the Iliad just ends. And in the pseudo-sequel, The Odyssey, this is a story where the Greeks are returning home after a successful siege of Troy. Achilles is already dead. So his death happens off screen. One of the most pivotal events in the narrative, eh. It, you know, just like Hulk in Avengers Endgame, his character development happened off screen. So what happens in the Odyssey? Well, one of our other heroes that we'll talk about, Odysseus, is leading a group of Greeks back home, back to Greece from Troy. And in one of their early misadventures, Odysseus and his men kill a Cyclops, who just happens to be the son of Poseidon. This is Polyphemus, the Cyclops, dies. Poseidon, his dad, is passed off. So what does he do? He throws Odysseus and his men all over the world. You can't get home. You're going to go over here, and you're going to go over there. I control the seas, and you killed my son. So they visit many locations and have many adventures and misadventures. There's monsters, there's, uh, it's, it is, um, 
constant peril. Many of the Greeks die. Many of their ships sink. But Odysseus wants to get home to his wife so that over the course of five books, he can murder everyone who's been trying to marry her because he's a hero. So yeah, they fight monster. Oh yeah, and, and uh, he's married, has kids, but he beds women left, right, and center all throughout these adventures. He's basically Captain Kirk. So, you know, he goes around, instead of a five-year mission, it's a 10-year mission, and uh, fights monsters, beds women. Real hero type. But he gets to speak to Achilles in one of these adventures in the underworld. That's the point of bringing up the Odyssey right now. Here's just a map. This is, so, the locations that Odysseus gets thrown to I have it there that they're mytho-historical because some of them get labels as to where they are. Most of them, it's really vague. They're not really intended as locations. But this map, uh, it's for fun. It's kind of animated and so on. It gives an idea of where those locations might be. Scholars have been debating and discussing these locations for literally millennia. And so these are just hypothesized locations of the various misadventures of Odysseus and his crew. Some of them are firmer than others. But keep in mind, in the Odyssey, they are all quite vague. On that note, the Odyssey is as old as the Iliad. What is the Greek world? We've talked repeatedly about the different time periods and the size of the Greek world. What is the Greek world uh, uh, in this early time period, in this archaic period? Does anyone remember? Yep, at the back. Exactly, yes. So if anyone, if you weren't here, able to hear that, it's the Aegean world between Asia Minor, where Troy is, uh, modern-day Turkey, and Greece. And the Odyssey is vague about these mythical locations because it doesn't really know the whole Mediterranean. The author doesn't really know this vast, wide world. But later authors who still read the Odyssey do know and so they start injecting more facts and more world building to the Odyssey that isn't actually present in the original text. And we, as moderns, inherit this tradition. And so that's how we can make maps like this and say, ah, they went to the Western Mediterranean because of this and this and this. But it's actually much more vague in the original. This just kind of hits at one of the core themes of the course reinterpretation over time. I've got a passage here from the Odyssey of when Odysseus is speaking to Achilles. Achilles has asked about his son. Odysseus responds, uh, he asks about his father and his son. Odysseus responds, I've heard nothing about your dad, but I can tell you about your son. Neo, uh, uh, Neo Ptolemaeus, Ptolemus, doesn't matter, his son. I brought him from Skyros in my well-made hollow ship. That's another one of those epithets, well-made hollow ship. To join the bronze-grieved ranks of the Achaeans. When we debated our plans before Troy, keep, this, keep these things in mind. Achilles doesn't know how the battle ends. We are before Troy. He was first to speak and his words were eloquent. Only God like Nestor of Nestor's cup fame were more so. <clears throat> Many were the men he killed in mortal combat. Theme song just popped into my head. I could not count or name them. All of his victims killed as he fought for the Argives. But what a warrior that Eurypheles, son of Telephus, was. So he na he he's killed an unnamed dozens of soldiers, 
But this specific named soldier also died. And he was a super awesome warrior. So he's building up the sun. All women desire for gain uh, uh, of him. So all women are attracted to him. And then he goes, so he says, he's killed all these people. Here's a named guy that he killed. He's eloquent, more eloquent than the most eloquent guy I know. Also, you know this like really handsome guy? Memnon, he was the handsomest man I ever saw. Uh, oh, sorry, next to uh, Memnon, he was the handsomest. So he's he's the second handsomest guy I've ever seen. And then we all climbed into that horse that got built, which, by the way, is not in the Iliad. The horse is not there. The Trojan War, the Trojan horse, because the war doesn't end. The war is continuing on. But in the in the horse, he uh, everyone was afraid he begged me endlessly to let him leap from the horse, toying with his sword hilt. He was the one, he wanted to be the first one out to go kill Trojans. And then when we sacked Priam's high city, he took ship with his share of the spoils and noble prize. So when we won the war, he got a good share. And there was never a wound. He was untouched by the sharp spears, unmarked by close combat. He was invincible in battle. When I had spoken, the spirit of Achilles went away with great strides through the field of Ashfoldel, rejoicing at my news of his son's greatness. So Achilles asked about his dad. Odysseus is like, oh. Asked about his son. And he finds out that his son is gorgeous, gets all the women, Murdered all the Trojans, got all the riches, and can speak with the most eloquent voice. Achilles is happy. But Achilles is dead. So it is important to know what the Achilles is in the Odyssey versus Achilles in the Iliad. Achilles is asking about his father and his son. He's asking about his family. And what he hears pleases him. His son was effective in battle. He was brave, good looks, and unharmed. But Achilles doesn't know about the battle before Troy, or the Trojan horse, or the fall of Troy, or the sack of Troy. The Iliad does not feature these things. It is in the Odyssey that we get both, and of course, many, many other stories. Many ancient sources mention both. Now I've talked a lot about what these ancient sources say and what they don't say. Why do you think the sack of Troy and the Trojan horse and the death of Achilles don't actually happen in the text? Now before you answer, think back to Hesiod and what he told us about the Titans, and what he felt we didn't need to hear. Yeah, at the back. Um, is it kind of like how um, like they did like the, the two TV episodes? Like they didn't have like the Trojan horse and the one hundred percent, exactly. Thank you. So it doesn't need to be said. It is what we all know. We are filling in the gaps. That is why this narrative is written to tell us what happened before and to tell us what happened after, because everyone knows that Troy fell. This is the things that we can learn from our sources, even when our sources aren't telling us things. Just keep these things in mind. If you are presented with something to read, you don't know the historical context and you don't know what's going on, that's fine. You can still learn a great deal by critically going through these sources. That's one of the things that I really want to repeatedly emphasize in this course. Speaking of sources, 
These are Loeb Classical Library um, volumes. They are English translations of ancient texts. They exist both as physical books and online. You have access to the Loeb Classical Library through the university. The uh, physical books are called the cloth edition. They actually have a nice kind of cloth cover, or at least the classical ones do. And then the online books are the digital editions. If the source was originally in Greek, the book will be green. If the source was originally in Latin, it will be red. And they are um, they're small little guys. They're very portable. So why am I talking about this? Well, in part because one of your sources, uh, Apod um, Diodorus of Sicily, or Diodorus Siculus, uh, I gave you a reading from his Loeb uh, edition. But I used a website that is a transcription of the Loeb and made a PDF of it for you. Because the Loeb online website is hard to use and kind of finicky. But I wanted to show it to you so that you can use it and can kind of dive into these sources more if you want. So this is the main kind of screen of a, a Loeb online edition. Pardon me one moment. <coughs> <coughs> Terrifying nature of every tickle in your throat feels like. So this is the main screen of the Loeb online edition. On the left, you will see the original language. And this is how, if you ever, whether you're in classics, whether you take something in, in uh, say, French or Spanish, uh, any kind of old language on, uh, so old French or uh, old um, Castilian or whatever, the original language is typically on the left. And then the more modern translation is typically on the right. That's how these books work, not just the lobes. So here we have Greek on the left. If you were in this source, you don't have to read the Greek. It's just there for reference so that you can quickly go back and forth between the translation and the original source if you know these languages. You have the English on the right. So when you read these books, you're basically just reading the right page and that's it. Skipping forward, right page, right page, right page. On the left-hand column, you will see numbers. For Diodorus Siculus, his uh, source is traditionally grouped into paragraphs. But oftentimes there are line numbers or chapters. Now, these might be chapter headings, but regardless, you will see numbers. And these will be conventional numbering that you can bring to other editions. So that's what those numbers are. That's why they're there, to help you reference things. Because the page numbers down here of the lobe are only good for the lobe. Now, you can also reference the page number. But when dealing with an ancient source, this is, this is just for your own information. I, you will almost certainly not have to use this in this class. Uh, and I, won't, I won't force you to use it in this class. But um, when making references, the page number only works for the lobe. Ancient translations, you want to make reference to those paragraphs. And then up at the top, you get the author, Diodorus Siculus, the work, the title in English, the Library of History, and then what lobe edition you are dealing with. Lobe Classical Library, LCL. And then this one is 368, or sorry, no, uh, 303. And then we are on page 368, 369. So that's just how the online lobe works. It's a bit of a cumbersome interface, but uh, it's very, very useful. And like I said, any ancient author that you want to read more of, you can. It's just accessible through the library. So one of our sources on Hercules, Diodorus Siculus. Who the heck is he and why do I care? He was a Roman era author, but he wrote in Greek. And I say Roman era because these, these eras kind of butt up against each other. 
The reason I can say Roman is because he was in Sicily, which was under Roman control in the first century BC or BCE. His, uh, his most famous work is the Library of History, and it's a world history. He is trying to narrate where everything came from and everything that has ever happened. No small task. And he is known for seeing a kernel of truth in a myth and trying to find how that would have transformed over time into the mythology that he knew. When uh, this comes to talking about the gods themselves, this is called euhemerism, after euhemus, who is a guy who did the same thing, where the gods are envisioned to have been just regular guys at first, that stories were told about them, and eventually this grew until they became godlike. So even in antiquity, we have people constantly reevaluating and critiquing the narratives of mythology. And this is particularly interesting and important with a figure like Heracles. Because if you know anything about Heracles, you know that he had a bunch of labors, that he had to do a bunch of stuff. Originally, before Diodor Siculus, before the sources that we're looking at, Heracles was just a guy. And he did some things, but there was no list. There was no list of deeds that he had to do. This is something that accumulated over time. So we know for a fact that this process happened that Diodorus is talking about. But what did Heracles do? What was his life like? According to Diodorus, well, he's got Zeus as his dad. And um, Alchemy, uh, I think it's supposed to be, yeah, Alchemene is his mom. Alchemene is immortal. Zeus seduces her by transforming one night into three. He basically makes the night last forever. And this is so the child born of their union will have exceptional might. Obviously, if you were Diodorus, the longer the lovemaking, the more potent the child. This is, this is the narrative. But Achmeni was a virtuous woman and would not be seduced by a strange man. Zeus knew this and decided... I'll just impersonate her husband. So, Amphitryon. Zeus transforms himself into a form that is her husband. For Diodorus, he injects into here, into this story, that Zeus was all about making a kid. This was not his typical lusty pursuits. And Zeus was very, very happy when a child was born, and announced it to all the gods. When the natural time of pregnancy had passed, Zeus, whose mind was fixed upon the birth of Heracles, announced in advance, in the presence of all the gods, that it was his intention to make the child who should be born that day king over the descendants of Perseus. Whereupon Hera, who was filled with jealousy, using as her helper, oh goodness, Ilathia, oh, uh, Il, Ilathia, Ilathia, her daughter, checked the birth pains of Alcmene and brought Eurystheus forth to the light before his time. Eurystheus is a king. Zeus, however, thought he had been outgeneraled. So this is outwitted, but in Greek, Obviously, the word used was for generalship, which is somewhat interesting. Wished both to fulfill his promise and to take the uh, thought for the future fame of Her Heracles. Consequently, 
he persuaded Hera to agree that Eurystheus should be king as he had promised, but that Heracles should serve Eurystheus and perform 12 labors. These to be whatever Eurystheus should prescribe, and that after he had done so, he should receive the gift of immortality. I believe that that he is Heracles, that Heracles will get the gift of immortality. Other features of Heracles' birth and life, according to Diodorus, Alcamene exposed him, and exposure, this is not, you know, woo, um, this, this is a process that was very familiar in the ancient world. You have an unwanted child, literally leave it out in the elements. It will die. This is a um, very uncomfortable reality, but it was one in the ancient world, very, very common. Heracles was uh, exposed because Alcamene, when she found out that her husband was not the man she lay with, it was Zeus, she was afraid of Hera. She was afraid that what Hera might do to her. And so she tried to hide the child. As it so happened, because this is ancient Greece, Hera and Athena were just walking around and found the baby. Athena uh, just said, hey, there's a baby. Hera, you should feed it. And uh, Hera tried to nurse the baby. But it was so strong, and it grabbed on with such force that she was freaked out and said, Nah! Get it away! I don't like it! And so Athena miraculously knew who the mom was and took the baby back to Alcamene and said, You should raise this kid. It's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Hera's fine. It's fine. And so she did. Alcamene and her husband, uh, 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 you remember the name, uh, Raise the kid as their own. Hera was displeased and sent two snakes to go kill Hercules. Heracles Heracles grabbed both snakes, killed them as a baby, because of course he did. And according to Diodorus, this is how he got his name. Because he got Kleos, which is glory, from Hera or because Hera tried to kill him. Hera Kleos. This is not the way everyone believes he got his name. This is Diodorus' specific story. Later in life, Her- Heracles married Megara, and he married her after literally genociding a group of people called the Minions. I think actually... Uh, Autocorrect strikes. There's a Y it's supposed to be in there. So he didn't kill a bunch of little yellow guys. <laughs> but maybe, maybe, maybe you kind of want that. I don't know, those movies. Anyway, but he he and I don't I don't mean this lightly. He murdered all of them, burned their houses to the ground. Modern definition of genocide. The labors were a duty, as I previously discussed, from birth. So we have here, after he has conducted his genocide, this is referred to as the deed. After this deed had been noised about throughout the whole of Greece, all men were filled with wonder at this unexpected happening. Wow, you're really good. How could uh, these people, the minions were attacking. So it's justified. You can totally genocide them. They were trying to take our stuff. Creon the king, admiring the high achievement of the young man, united his daughter Megara in marriage to him and entrusted him with the affairs of the city as though he were his lawful son. But Eurystheus, the ruler of Argolis, viewing with suspicion the growing power of Heracles, summoned him to his side and commanded him to perform the labors. I'm calling in my bet, buddy. You got to do the thing. Heracles ignored the summons. Zeus dispatched word to him to enter the service of Eurystheus, whereupon Heracles journeyed to Delphi, and on inquiring of the god regarding the matter, he received a reply, go do the thing. you got to do the thing. And when you do the thing, you will become immortal. 
So that is kind of that for, uh, I mean, Diodorus also narrates the, the labors and so on. But we also got another source. I gave you some Apollodorus as well this week. What does Apollodorus have to say about Heracles? Well, broadly similar. Divine parentage, Zeus and Alcamene. Long nights. No, uh, I think the exceptional might there is still there. But there's no mention of that Zeus is in this just for the baby making. This is just one of Zeus's many conquests for Apollodorus. And Zeus did tra change into Amphitryon. Same kind of thing there. However, Alcamene was pregnant with a son by both Zeus and Alcamene, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Amphitryon at the same time. So Heracles in Apollodorus has a brother, Iphicles. Isn't that cool? He also had an interesting adolescence. Uh, one of the interesting things that he did is he just straight up murdered a guy. The guy hit him and called him nasty names. And Heracles is like, I got this liar from Apollo. I'm going to beat you to death with it. Don't mess with a guy with a liar. He was also taught by everyone under the sun. He was taught to drive chariots by Amphitryon, to wrestle by Autocolus, to shoot a bow, to fight in armor, to play the lyre. After Linos had come, oh, and the guy, oh, it was the guy who taught him how to do it. After Linos had come to Thebes and become a Theban, he was slain by Heracles, who hit him with his lyre. Heracles killed him in a fit of rage because Linos had struck him. So he taught him how to play the lyre, and then he was beaten to death. Heracles is um, not the most stable in Apollodorus. This is a theme that will reoccur. He was acquitted because it was uh, any man who defends himself against an instigator of unjust violence is innocent. So he was innocent because the other guy started it, and I finished it. Heracles surpassed everyone in size and strength. It was obvious from his appearance that he was Zeus's son, for his body was four cubits tall, and a fiery radiance shone from his eyes. He did miss a shot with his bow or his javelin, and when he was 18 years old, out with the herd, he killed the Cithuronian lion. That's exactly how you pronounce it. There will be a test. Which used to rush from Mount Cithaeron, Ah, and ravaged the cattle of Amphitryon, as well as those of Thespius. Thespius was a king of Thespii. How coincidental, coincidental. Heracles wanted to kill the lion. He went to this man. Thespius entertained him with, as a guest for 50 days and had one of his daughters, and he had 50 of them, sleep with Hercules, Heracles every night before he went out to hunt. Heracles was eager for all, or sorry, um, Thespius was eager for all of his daughters to have children with Heracles. Heracles was like, one chick is the same as another, right? He thought that he was always sleeping with the same woman, and he slept with all of them. After overpowering the lion, he wore its skin and used its gaping jaws as a helmet. This is why Heracles is draped in a lion skin. If you ever see imagery, uh, we will revisit this, especially during our Roman section. There's a very famous statue of Heracles um, with the lion skin. So there are also some other differences. Heracles didn't necessarily genocide the minions, but he did cut off their ears, noses, and hands. He tortured them. That kind of describes the. Do they have noses? Do they have ears? Just eyes. Anyway, he tortures them, doesn't wipe them all out. And prize for this murder is Megara. And he immediately has kids with her. And he is Heracles. He is awesome. But also, Hera drives him mad, and he straight up murders his kids and also a couple of his nephews. This is not viewed as a positive. He must make atonement 
for this murder. And the punishment for the murder is his labors. But this instability returns. After this battle against the minions, it happened that Heracles was driven mad because of his jealousy of Hera. He threw his own children by Meg into a fire, along with two of Iphicles' sons. For this, he was condemned to exile. He was purified by Thespius, and going to Delphi, he asked the gods what he should, uh, where he should settle. Pythia then, for the first time, called him by the name Heracles. So this is a Heracles gets his name uh, narrative in Apollodorus. Up until, up until then, he had been called Alcides. She told him to settle in Tyrans and serve Eurystheus for 12 years. She also told him to accomplish 10 labors. And when those labors are done, you'll become immortal. So, slight differences. There's 10 here. All right. Iphicles is like, you just murdered two of my sons. Would you like a third? He's going to join you on your adventures. I'm totally okay with this. So, Aeolus joins Heracles in his adventures. After they go on a, a bunch of these quests, Heracles is like, I forgot I had a wife. I murdered my kids. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Yolius, you've done, you've served me well. You want a wife? And he literally gives his wife to Yolius as a prize for helping him in his adventures. And he's like, I want a new wife. And he hears about an archery contest, and he's like, I'm going to go arch. And I'm going to be the best archer, and I'm going to win a woman. And he wins. And the king who offered the contest is like, I do not want to give my wife to you, murder man. And he refused to give, uh, sorry, I don't want to give my daughter to you as a wife. And he refused to hand over his daughter. Heracles is like, I get it. I do like to murder. You mind if I just chill here for a bit? I will be fine. And um, he promises to be a good guest. What do you think happens? So the first part of here is where uh, Eolius gets a new wife. He beat them in archery. Euro uh, the king, Eurytus, said, um, he went back on his word and said they were afraid that Heracles might once again kill any children that might father. Not too long afterwards, some cattle were stolen from Euboa by Atokolus. Uh, Eurytus thought that this had been done by Heracles. Iphitus is like, nah, he didn't do it. He met him leaving Pharaoh, where Heracles had saved the dying Alcetus from, oh, man, these names, invited him to join the search for cattle. Heracles promised that he would, uh, he would help and treated Iphitus as his guest. But he went crazy once more and threw him into the wall of Tyrans. He picked him up and blotted him against a wall. There was little to be done for this purification. He, he got purified again, but he just murders over and over and over. So, what do we have here in terms of the two different narratives that we've covered for the labors of Hercules? In Diodorus, it's servitude from birth. There are occasional war crimes. Oops, I did a war crime. And there are 12 labors from the very beginning. In Apollodorus, it is penance for one of his many murder sprees. And there are 10 labors to be accomplished over 12 years. In Apollodorus, Heracles finishes in eight years. He's like, I did the 10. I'm the best. Time to murder. Uh, and Eurystheus has said, you know, two of them didn't count. So you got to do two more. So he ends up doing 12 anyway. And of course, so much murder. So what do we do today? We finished Achilles from Monday. I gave you an introduction to the lobes, and we covered Heracles. Uh, Friday, I'll talk about the midterm and, of course, creature feature. Thanks. Have a good day.